What is up, my exchange family from all over the world, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guests today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing, ladies? Hey, good to see you guys. It's been a week <laughs> since we've done a live. It's been like a week. A whole week. Absolutely, and happy Election Day to you all as well. So you, you too, Chief. Yes. So y'all go out there and vote because that's what you should, should do as an American. So you wanna, hear it from wanna, Chief. Want to plug that before we get into our guest today. So <laughs> uh, excited about our guest today. Uh, we have uh, a wonderful guest that's going to give our viewers some great information about the organization he represents that truly embodies the total force construct. Uh, without further ado, Julie, do you mind introducing today's guest? Chief, you are so right. We have a terrific guest with us today, and he's going to have a lot of great information for our viewers. He served our nation for 37 years in the Army, retiring as a Major General. He continues his life of service with the Reserve Organization of America, where he is the Executive Director. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Jeff Phillips. Hey. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thanks so much, Jeff, for taking time out to join us. We appreciate you doing that. And everybody watching, drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you have any questions for Jeff, we'll be reading those live throughout the broadcast. Now is the perfect time to start your watch party so you can enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not following us, you should. So you will know who's coming up next on Chief Chat. This is episode 74, and we have great guests lined up all through the fall. Awesome. Awesome. And so it, it's a little weird for me. Uh, I, I gotta be honest with you because on the script, it says Jeff and, and then I, it got major general and you got, sir, like, I want to call you about three or four different things. Uh, so, well, but, chief, a, a lot of people have called me a lot of things <laughs> you Err on the side of Jeff. You won't go wrong. Roger that. Okay, Jeff. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time to talk with us today. And can you tell us where you're calling us from today? Well, I'm calling from my office, uh, ROA, Reserve Organization of America, which was founded in 1922, uh, has our headquarters right on the corner of First and Constitution, directly across from the U.S. Capitol. So we're in a five-story building that we own, and I'm in my office, and I'm en enjoying uh, Capitol Hill kinds of technology. We have, we're now on our third computer to get me some video and audio, so I'm actually <laughs> now speaking to you from my, I think, five- or six-year-old iPhone. <laughs> which of course is obsolete but then so am i so if that all works but uh, <laughs> judging by the lousy video that i myself can see of myself uh not that i look much better in good video this is probably a good opportunity for our listeners just to go on audio if they want to <laughs> <laughs> no, no you're no, coming in you're coming in great jeff we, we are good. we are going to make sure you are good to go and like you I said appreciate. <laughs> i can use all the help i can get <laughs> So Jeff, tell us about your, before we get started, tell us about your pocket square. You got a little pocket Whoa, square action going yeah, well, on today. It, <laughs> Gotta to see it a little bit. There, there we go. <laughs> Some of our viewers may be familiar uh, with this pocket square. It's, it's one of an ensemble offered by a company called Pocket Square Heroes. And I have no financial interest in the company, but it was begun recently by a man named a former Marine or uh, Marine, not former Marine, Absolutely. named Chris Costa. Uh, who had started this company and he offers these pocket squares in various hues and designs, the, the various campaign rib ribbons. Of course, mine's the Iraqi campaign service ribbon. Uh, I have a De desert storm pocket square. There's, there's ones with wow. service colors and all, all sorts of different designs. And uh, I'm, I'm wearing mine proudly today be for this audience. Well, it, it looks great. Kinda, it also kind of goes with my red tie, so that works. <laughs> it, it, it does. does well. You're looking good. Looking good today. Yes, and, <laughs> I, and I have that. I have that campaign medal on my. Well, I don't have a pocket square, but I got the the, rib, the ribbon uh, well, we, I have. So well, Chief, we got to get you a pocket square. Oh, yeah. Christmas yeah. gift <laughs> idea for Chief. <laughs> Maybe some elves will drop it off for you for Christmas. Oh, yeah. You never know. So, so Jeff, can you tell us about the Reserve Organization of America, sure. better known as ROA? Too. Um, Y'all have a rich history of advocating for the Reserve and National Guard, all ranks, all services. So we'd love to hear about your mission and what can you, what, whatever else you want to share with us. 
Well, I know, thank you. I know it seems like a long time ago, but there was this war called World War I, about a hundred years ago. And uh, after the war was over, great Americans came home and they resumed their civilian life or some of them stayed in the military. There were a group of officers, 144 officers, who saw what was happening, that the, the army especially, and also the Navy, but the army was being reduced drastically. And everyone assumed it was the war to end all wars and there wouldn't be any more war. Well, these officers started, started and one of them was General Black Jack Pershing, who commanded all US troops in World War I in, in Europe. They formed the Reserve Officers Association in 1922 to advocate for a strong military. In those days, that meant the army and the Navy. And their membership was, uh, was army in those days. They went on to become chartered in 1950. They were responsible for uh, ensuring that about 100,000 100, army officers in the army reserve were ready in 1940 and 41 when General Marshall uh, started rebuilding the army to ultimately the military was about 16 million in World War II. So ROA was an integral part of ensuring that we had a strong military to, uh, to defeat tyranny in both Europe and in the Pacific. In the Cold War years, we also uh, advocated for strong military to ensure that freedom in Europe and elsewhere in, in, in the world. And uh, we've gone on to do that. Our focus is to support the reserve and the guard. So we support a strong national security, which is our founding purpose, through a focus exclusively and solely on the reserve and the guard of the, of the uniformed services. And that includes NOAA and the public health system. And we're the only national okay. military organization to have that sole exclusive focus. Well, that's awesome too, because um, uh, I think before we uh, got on the chat, we uh, told you that I, I was a Marine, but I also was in the reserves for about three and a half years after I uh, separated from the Marine Corps. So I did, a, and, and there, there's always a stipulation or a stigma from active duty to reserve and the sure. difference, but uh, when I when I joined right after 9/11, uh, well, I joined the reserve at, right after 9/11, and that's when you saw the total force happening because we were all deploying to Afghanistan and then Iraq together um, at, as a total force. And kind of before before 9/11, people just kind of looked at the reserve like, hey, these are just you know, weekend warriors or whatever the case may be. So right. uh, definitely after 9-11, man, we, 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 we show that, hey, we, we need everybody in this fight together. So. Everybody. Well, a, a huge portion of the Army uh, is in the Army Reserve and the Guard. In fact, I think something like 70% of the medical, the logistics are in the Army Reserve. And I was a regular Army officer. I was a tank officer uh, when I came out of ROTC, went right into a, a tank division in Europe. So I was a tanker as a young officer, regular army. I didn't go into reserves until after Desert Storm and started to understand what the reserves were all about. Just as you say, Chief, we didn't, I didn't even think about the reserves when I was a young regular army officer, didn't understand it, didn't even cross my mind. And then I slowly became under, uh, aware of, of the extent that they, uh, that they are in throughout the military. And then starting in, in Desert Storm, especially with the support provided by the Army Reserve. And also there was a great National Guard artillery battalion saw action there. The Guard was doing airlift. So it, 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 both the uh, reserve components, which is the Army Reserve and the National Guard uh, or the reserves of the forces, not just the Army Reserve, were very involved in Desert Storm. But as you say, after 9-11, that just mushroomed uh, and, and about half of the force on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan has been in the reserve components. Absolutely. Great information. So you've, you've touched a little bit on this, but who, can you share with us who is eligible to join ROA and then what are the benefits of becoming a member? The membership essentially is open to all ranks, all services, whether you're currently serving or you've separated, you're retired, or you finished out your hitch and you're left to do something else. As long as you uh, left the service under honorable conditions, we can, uh, uh, some family members can be, uh, can be ROA members as well. So it's pretty wide open. And in about three years ago, we changed our name. Now our chartered name, Congressional Charter, one of the few organizations that has a Congressional Charter is the Reserve Officers Association, which dates back to our founding. But about three years ago, we did a doing business as a DBA, Reserve Organization of America. We kept the old title 
but we're using Reserve Organization of America because we truly are representing all ranks, all services. E1 up to, was it, 010? Yes, sir. Absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm curious to know, because every every soldier has a story, right? And mm -hmm. so uh, um, it, we always kind of go back and, and we, we've done all this stuff through our career, but we I, I really want to try to get your story out to the people. Uh, so can you tell us some kind of career highlights and, and maybe uh, why you joined the Army um, to begin with, and then kind of how you, your service has kind of got you uh, ready for this, your current role right now? Well, I'm, 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 my story isn't anywhere near as glorious or exciting as probably yours is, Chief. But my dad was a <laughs> pilot in World War II in Europe. He flew transport planes, the kind they jumped out of in D-Day, although he hadn't gotten over to Europe uh, in June 44. He came uh, about eight months later. And I grew up with a dad who was a was a pilot. He, he, he was my hero. Uh, he's gone now. But I, I wanted to be a pilot. And uh, I, I that was all I was focused on doing. When I went to get my driver's license, I was 16 in 1973. That'll, that'll date me. <laughs> I found out that I have a color vision problem. Oh, it's no. called a color deficiency. Wow. One of my many deficiencies is a color deficiencies. And uh, my dad said, that means you can't be a military pilot, uh, which is probably the worst thing my father ever said to me in his long life. And I had to figure out what I was going to do next. Well, my father had always said that he would have enjoyed being in the infantry in World War II, which struck me as odd, but that's what he would say. So I, I went to my guidance counselor's office uh, uh, shortly thereafter, and I picked up an Army ROTC brochure. And the next thing I know, I was marching into the Army ROTC office at the University of Massachusetts as an incoming freshman. And I never looked back. And when it came time for me to branch, I had been on a rifle range as probably a sophomore ROTC cadet thinking I was going to go infantry. And I heard a rumble behind me on the range road behind the range. This is up at Fort Devens, Mass. And a, and a platoon of M48A5s went by behind me. And those guys in those days, tankers wore black berets. And those dudes mm -hmm. are up in their cupolas and they were they were styling. They were profiling <laughs> those black berets and those tanks. And I made my decision and I went into tanks. I briefly, I went to airborne school, got five jumps. I think it was on my second or third jump that I, that I decided for sure I was going to go into tanks where I didn't have to jump any further than about 48 <laughs> inches. And uh, I never looked back. And so I went into tanks and, and it was fabulous. Uh, uh, and that's when you're a youngster, that's the kind of stuff you want to do. And then, um, and then I went into public affairs and I had made the mistake in, in at UMass of getting a journalism degree. So when it, <laughs> when it came time, didn't, I didn't learn anything, but I got the degree. Uh, I guess the best thing for me in college was I got out with a second lieutenant's bars and that started my whole life. But the army shipped me off to public affairs school, made me a public affairs officer where I actually did learn to write in army public affairs school. And then a, a, a really cool thing happened that I would never have thought would be cool. Here, so here's, I'm a tanker. I just had a tank company command, M1 Abrams, the second army division at Fort Hood. And I got shipped over to the first cavalry division to be the division public affairs officer. Now, if you know anything about the second mm -hmm. army division and the first cav division, you know, they hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> they, did. they did, it was a hell of a rivalry, cats and dogs. So here I was, a second army division tanker, ready to go take on the Red Army. <laughs> and I was all of a sudden the chief cheerleader of the first cavalry division. Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, orders is orders. And then pretty quickly we got alerted for the Gulf and off we went for Desert Shield, which turned into Desert Storm. And my job in Desert Storm was to run a little group of public affairs soldiers to do combat photography, we produced a newspaper in the desert. And then when we came back uh, through the help of the First Cavalry Division Association, we produced a wonderful coffee table book on the, on the, the division's service in, the, in Shield and Storm, which is still one of my points of pride. Uh, mm -hmm. it, not what I would have expected to have done as a young tank officer, but you know, the army gives you something to do and you do it. Absolutely. And it works out pretty cool. well. Awesome. Yeah, well, I have a great admiration for public affairs because my co-hosts are freaking public affairs extraordinaire. So, because uh, I have zero oh, zero background in public affairs or anything public, I don't even know how this face even made it. 
that. <laughs> I'm here, like you said, they, they gave me a job and I'm gonna do it. That's right. That's right. You're doing good, Chief. You're a natural. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Nobody would have ever known, Chief, if you didn't tell them. Yeah, I, I got a I got a face for radio though. That's that's what I, that's what I <laughs> Yeah. I need to advise you though, as public affairs, don't say you don't know that you can't, that you're not a face for public. You are. You're own it. You got it. You're rocking it. You're yes. doing great. Own it, Chief. I am it. So. You're right. Okay. I am right. I like that. <laughs> so your office, Jeff, um, you are part of the Exchange Retiree Advisory Council. So can you tell us a little bit about your role on the council and then how that strengthens the exchange benefit? Well, thank you. We're really proud to be associated with the council. And we're really proud to be consider ourselves friends of AFES. Tom Scholl, your CEO, is a, just a great American a ranger, airborne infantry, White House fellow. He has done so much for the nation that yes. folks don't know about. And, uh, he was uh, he, uh, he was given the uh, award of a Minuteman Hall of Fame by ROA yes. just a couple of years ago for his leadership at AFES as AFES itself has really supported the reserve and the guard. And our, our presence on the, the, the council uh, helps us to communicate to AFES specific issues and subtleties and technicalities that are associated with reserve service. Uh, for instance, uh, through that relationship, we helped get AFES permission through the service. It wasn't just through AFES, we had to work through the services mm -hmm. to help members of the Guard and Reserve when they drill on post to be able to buy their, their uniforms, the Army especially at the, at, we, I still call it the PX. Uh, mm -hmm. Before that, they had to go, I guess, mail order to get their uniforms. Uh, so we said, okay, if, when you're on duty, you can go buy a uniform. It, it makes common sense. But one of the things that we're battling is that most of the rules and regulations and policies for DOD as pertaining to the Reserve and Guard were written in the Cold War when the Reserve and Guard didn't really get that actively involved. Mm -hmm. So now here we are, as Chief said, especially since 9-11, we're essentially, we're an operational reserve, we're 24 seven, we're there, and the policies are still catching up. And one of ROA's functions is to help catch them up a little bit more quickly. Working on the council has helped us do that. And we found tremendous interest in, and responsiveness from AFES. So we really value that. Oh, we value, value you guys as well and, and all the great work that, that you're doing to advocate for those who give up their give up their time right in their their lives to to serve in the garden reserve yeah there's a lot of pressure on these young men and women back when i was a, a young lieutenant captain major the reserving guard it was like chief said the joke was weekend warrior there was an element of truth in that mm -hmm. they were ready to go but they were never used and now usage is up something like 15 times the level it was in the 1980s it reached 60 times that level back in 2007 at the height of the war in Iraq. These men and women are being called into service. Uh, they're going overseas. They're having to tell their employer, hey, boss, I may not be around again. Uh, hey, to their spouse, sweetheart, I may not be around for birthdays. It's almost for many of them like active service and they're hanging in there. The, yep. these, are, these are young American heroes. And ROA also stands behind and supports their employers. We're standing with them and of course the families uh, we appreciate all of that and we're working to help them so that they can help these members um, serve their country wow that's excellent jeff so let's um turn directions just a little bit um we're in some unexpected times right now so has covid changed the way your office is working um and then and what how have you guys shifted uh, when when the whole pandemic really got its start with back in March, mm -hmm. my chief of staff and I talked together about, we have a small staff, about eight people. So uh, we said, well, what are we going to do with this? We, neither one of us had ever been through a pandemic. Uh, but we decided to basically send everybody home and work remotely. And we'd never done that before here. We had no real record of ever doing that, but we figured we could make it work. The Air Force E9 and an, and an Army, whatever I am, Major General. <laughs> and uh, so we said, he said, okay, go home. We're going to figure this out. Don't come back. 
when this thing gets over with, we'll talk it out. No one is going to have to come back until they feel safe. However, we own a $20 million, $25 million building on Capitol Hill. And Lonnie and I decided we wanted one of us to be in the building during working hours every day. Our building also has offices for a couple corporations are in here. So we wanted to have a, an ROA human being on the premises during working hours, five days a week. So she and I basically uh, did day on and day off. I did three days, she did, she did two. It's worked out very well. Like the rest of the world, I guess we've learned how to, how to make it work. And what we have learned, like I guess the rest of the world is you can make it work. And yeah. maybe you lose a little productivity, but maybe you gain some other uh, efficiencies our, our, our staff doesn't have to fight traffic. We have uh, one or two members of our staff were commuting two hours in and two hours out to get to work. Oh, gosh, That doesn't happen anymore. I, I used to have to drive one hour in and out. It's now down to 45 minutes because of no traffic. Fortunately, I enjoy driving. Um, but yes, we, we are no longer working uh, full, fully out of the building. We're working out of our homes. We've arranged technology to take care of that. We've kept the building clean. We've installed new filters to meet the new uh, requirements for uh, the pandemic. Uh, the building is clean, it's kept up. In fact, we've done a lot of maintenance to the building that we uh, had put off. Now that it's empty, we've repaved the driveway and done some odds and ends mm -hmm. uh, that we could. So actually the building is in pretty good shape. Looking forward to everyone coming back eventually. Yes. But ROA is, is up and running. Absolutely. So. Um, Jeff, can you touch on the ROA's priorities and uh, can you kind of expound on the, the biggest issue you feel like you're, they're facing your members right now, especially during the sure. pandemic? ROA was founded to ensure, in those days they used the word defense, strong defense. Uh, we now say national security, same thing. So ROA's primary focus is on readiness. It's on military readiness and everything that's involved in that. So there are some organizations, and I belong to some great ones, that are very interested in ensuring that veterans get their benefits, disability benefits, retirement, all those things that are very important. ROA is focused on making sure that uh, members are trained, they have the equipment they need, their families are supported when they leave, uh, their employers uh, have incentives. So we're working on tax credits for employers of the Guard and Reserve. So that when you leave the Garden Reserve gets, a, uh, to serve in the Garden Reserve, your employer maybe gets a tax credit to help pay for getting a replacement in there while you're gone, uh, things like that. So, but it's all focused on readiness. Um, now, do we do some benefits things? Sure, but they're basically designed around or they're focused around ensuring people know that their service is important, that there is a reduced, that there is a reduced um, burden on them for serving. So it all adds up to military readiness. So we have a very strong legislative program. Uh, we're working on ensuring that people are, when they're mobilized, they're under the right duty status. Something that you can see as benefits, but we see as readiness is we want to ensure that you get credit for, for your service, that if you miss a drill, that we can get some kind of a constructive credit so you get a good year. Uh, when uh, members of the guard got cut a day uh, short on their orders, uh, a couple of months ago, they were getting 89 day orders, which meant that they didn't get certain educational benefits, certain early retirement benefits. ROA went to bat, wrote letters to the president, wrote letters to Congress, and a couple of days later, it got turned around. And so those orders got extended, so they got the credit. Now, you could say, well, that's nice for the members of the Reserve and Guard, and, and, we, and we're glad we could do something nice. But really, the way we saw it was we're building in incentives and we're reducing burdens for that member of the military and his or her family to stay in. Absolutely. We want them to say, yeah, my service was valued. I got the, I got the benefits that I had earned and I like what I'm doing and I'm going to stay in. That's military readiness. Absolutely. And, and I'll, like you said, it's tied to if, if I'm on orders for 89 days and I'm going to fight in a contingency, uh, but I don't have the benefits for my family that are back home, that, that, directly ties in effect and readiness. It does, because there are pressures. You may have a job elsewhere and you may be giving up an opportunity to be promoted in that job because you're gone to the to the Air Force Reserve or the Marine Corps Reserve or the or the Air National Guard. And you're saying you, you got a trade off. Well, you may at some point you may say, you know, this trade off thing is getting a little tough to pull off. And my as my spouse is beginning to ask some questions and my boss is beginning to ask some questions and maybe I just better make a tough decision. We don't want people to get to that point. Exactly. Mm. That's awesome. 
Now, the exchange is an important non-pay non benefit for service members and families, and we are also focused on readiness and resiliency. Can you talk to us about why the exchange matters and maybe share a time oh, the exchange was there for you? Well, the exchange is one of the favorite things in my, in my memories as a young officer. I think I spent my first several paychecks buying stuff at the exchange in Bamberg <laughs> and Nuremberg. I got stereos at Rhine Mine. In those days, Rhine Mine Air Base had the most magnificent stereo store. <laughs> uh, and I still have all that stuff. It's oh, cool. Awesome. I still have That's awesome. Uh, but we, I think I our our products last paycheck. forever. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the thing about analog stuff is it actually lasts versus, versus digital. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, the, uh, the AFES is a, is a tremendous earned benefit. The ability to shop, to get a good deal, to get great products and services. And now it's been expanded to online to all veterans. Of course, there are yeah. full benefits for, for retirees, Medal of Honor recipients, others. But it's, it's a way of saying thank you that is recognized. It's convenient for those members who, and their families who live on post or are, are near a post, not so much the reserve and guard, but for active especially, it's right there. They can get to it. It's secure. They don't have to worry about anything. They get a good deal. Uh, for those of us who do mail order, it's a fabulous deal. So, And we also know that uh, the, the exchange provides a lot of money to MWR. I think it's about $2.3 billion in the last 10 years alone. Uh, yeah. AFES has provided to morale, welfare, and recreation in, in the military. And something like, what, is it half of half of the AFES st staff is military? Something like that? 85% uh, of us have a have a direct connection to the military. It could be like my nieces in the guard. So that's my huh? direct military connection. Um, Le Leah military has family spouse. members, military spouses. Um, Veterans. And yeah, I mean, it's, so, an, it's a family and right. you all have done great with the grab and go with something like 100,000 grab and go meals have been distributed. Yes, uh, during the AFES. pandemic. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So I, I would, you know, you know, with 37 years in uniform, who am I to say anything uh, about AFES other than it's fabulous. And uh, <laughs> I know I know my brothers and sisters in the naval services. I'm not sure the Marines would call themselves the naval services, but with their <laughs> with their exchange system. Uh, I think they feel similarly about their exchange system. Well, that's excellent, Jeff. Thanks for sharing that. I want to take a second to pause and look at the live feed. We have folks watching from all over the world. Jose says hi from Puerto Rico. Sandy says Hola. hello. Um, we do have a question about veterans and how they can shop the commissary. Um, so I believe that ties right in with the veterans online shopping benefit that that came about in 2017. Is that right? That really? Yes. Yep, you're right, Leah. <laughs> and this year, January 1st, 2020, all veterans with service connected disabilities, any percent can now shop in store and in the commissaries. So I hope that is helping to answer your question, Elfried about um, in-store shopping for its disabled veterans with a service-connected disability. Patricia says, hello from Maine. Hey, my and... parents are from Maine. My parents are both from oh. South Portland. Oh, awesome. wow. Right. Awesome. And then before we wrap up, Jeff, can you remind our viewers where can, they can go online to find out more about ROA and then how they can get involved? Well, thank you very much. Uh, our website is ROA, Romeo Oscar Alpha dot O-R-G, ROA dot O-R-G. We just redid the website, so we hope you like it. Like all other websites, we'll probably redo it again in a year. <laughs> uh, but right now, it's pretty brand spanking new. And I, it's I, clean and looking. It. it looks well, we great. I was there, checking it out. And, and mm -hmm. I also want to give out my email address if anyone wants to contact me. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can remember the phonetic alphabet and do this phonetically. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So my email at work is um, Juliet Papa Hotel India Lima Lima India Papa Sierra. That's built. That should spell J Phillips at R O A dot org. J Phillips with two L's at R O A dot org. Shoot me an email if you got a question. You were thinking about something. Uh, you know, and we'll we'll go back and forth if we if we want to talk on phone. I'll give you a shout. But uh, please do contact us. We're, 
we're very proud of what we do for our citizen warriors of all services and ranks, their families, veterans, and supporting our employers as they support the force. So uh, we, we're very pleased to be also part of the AFES family. And uh, we thank you so much for what you at AFES do for our military community, irreplaceable. Absolutely. And uh, your thank phonetic you. alphabet spelling was, was so spot on, it's ridiculous. <laughs> No, you, Great you, job. You are you are certified. <laughs> oh, I'm certified, all right. <laughs> so, uh, sir, we really, really appreciate you uh, chatting with us today, and you gave us some really great information about uh, the ROA. So, hopefully, uh, our, our brothers and sisters in the reserves and the guard, uh, they they got a good POC and know that you guys are going to bat for them. So, we definitely appreciate you. Uh, thank you and your family for uh, you know. You got a long lineage of, of, of military members in your family, man. So thank yeah. them for their service and sacrifice. You're very welcome. Uh, and remember, if you're thinking about going into tanks, when you're in a tank, you never have to fight anybody for a parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Very true. Oh, man, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> the perk. That's the perk. Right. Yes. Got me to gold. <laughs> exactly. So that so this, like I said, this means so much to our airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coast Guard personnel, and the new Space Force personnel as well. So, um, you know, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, making a difference to all those who serve. Uh, it's an honor. Honor to serve. Absolutely. And so if you could hang back after the Zoom is over with, I got to get some information from you. Thanks, y'all. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Chief, Chief shout out. out. Yep. <laughs> <I know>. Bye. <laughs>